there good morning before we go into a long weekend i'm going to be doing a live today with kat and we're going to be concentrating on pop-up store interiors of course the topic of visual merchandising is an important topic whenever it comes to retail retail interiors retail design and atmospherics we have seen uh, a lot uh, of scholarly articles, books, uh, uh, talking about visual merchandising, visual merchandising practices, and uh, different aspects of visual merchandising related to different brands, and how these brands uh, wish to relate uh, through their design to their target audiences, uh, or to meet specific objectives. Of course, when it comes to visual merchandising, we're always uh, looking at two perspectives. At, uh, from the brand's perspective, uh, we aim always to create retail environments that meet the brand's objective, of course. And from the consumer's side, uh, whether he is a utilitarian consumer or a hedonic consumer and his shopping uh, experience objectives, to which type of brand and interiors would he be relating the most? Uh, with Kat, however, we're going to be looking at the details of the conception of the interior of a retail store and we're going to be uh, especially uh, looking at uh, the development of these interiors uh, for today's pop-up stores and especially uh, those uh, pop-ups uh, that uh, could uh, work with startup brands or collective brands and others. We're going to be discovering all of this. Uh, so I'm going to invite Kat in to kick off with this beautiful conversation. Joining with Kat from the UK. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> Hi there. How are you? I'm fine. How about you? <laughs> really, really well. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> I'm so happy that we're doing this as well. And last time when we were doing like uh, the introduction chat, we had so many ideas that we, <laughs> we hope uh, to talk about today. So uh, I'm going to leave the floor to you as usual uh, for you to just uh, give us a little intro about who you are and how you came across working with visual merchandising. Yes, indeed. Well, um, I, when I first started working, I don't think I even knew what visual merchandising was. I didn't um, understand it as a job role and didn't. Yeah, even though that it was something that you could do. Um, and I actually I actually did an art and design um, degree. So I did textile design. Um, but when I was a student, I had always worked in retail, you know, different shops um, throughout, you know, throughout the whole time I was studying. And when I left, um, I actually initially got a full time position on the shop floor with um, Marks and Spencer's. Um, and I, I loved it. I just loved serving customers and I just loved the whole retail um, environment. And then, and then whilst I was there, they started, um, you know, advertising for roles as a visual merchandiser and, um, you know, creating the window displays. Um, and, so, and so I did that for quite a few years with them. And what, what I loved about it is that it took all that art and design education that I had but um, put it into an environment where you could um, could use those skills really instantly and really quickly and make a real big difference. Often yeah. when you're you know designing clothes or fabric or a print or something, everything does take quite a long time and it might never get to the end um, end result that you that you want. But uh, in retail. Um, what I love about it is that you can make change really quickly and instantly yes. and then also see the results because you see that through sales or visually what it looks like or by talking to customers and, and I love that instant feel about it um, and then from there and I, I just I started working for brands um, you know within their head offices 
creating guidelines and training people. Um, and then I've worked for agencies as well before working, you know, for myself now. So I work with lots of different brands to, to help them. But so you I had you... this career, this career path was, was there for me, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, it's really nice how uh, the discovery was accidental and how it grew and evolved to be like a career that uh, also helps you learn and grow. And we're going to be talking about all of this in a few. So just to, to de demystify a little bit uh, this uh, idea or concept or definition of visual merchandising and as you said which uh, is the essence of retail but very few uh, know about it and know that it exists as a position and as a maybe career path so what is visual merchandising and is it only about the aesthetics in a retail store that is yeah, a very good question and a very, yeah, very big question. And I always um, liken visual merchandising to, it's the, we're a really important part of the retail process. And what, what, what visual merchandisers do is bring everything together that everyone else has worked, worked towards. We have to bring it all together. So you can have like a really fantastically um, designed product, um, but and you can have um, the right amount of product arrive in the store at the right time. The store concept can be, um, can be beautiful and the marketing can be all, all right. But if those things don't all join together and the visual merchandiser needs to understand holistically that whole process, um, because how it's displayed on the shop floor and how the customer interacts with it is the most important part, really. Um, and I think what's um, what's become as I've as I've grown through my career and how retail um, has has grown, people brands involve visual merchandising um, further and further um, at the beginning of the journey. So even at the beginning of product design and range planning, that's where the VM person or department needs to be involved, so that when it reaches the shop floor. Um, it's it's it all comes together. When when I first started working, you know, many many years ago, sometimes we would just get a delivery, and then we wouldn't even know what that was, and we had to make it look and work well well. But there's so much more to it than that. Um, and I always um, think that visual merchandising is a real commercial. It's a commercial tool, um, but also um, you know aesthetically, it has to it has to work. So it's a real there's always a real balance, balance. to be met between yeah. um, something working commercially, but visually um, impactful and um, the right brand's image as well. You can't have something that commercially sells, even if you sell loads of, loads of the product and you think you're making lots of money, if it doesn't match your brand image or the marketing that's been developed around it, I, I, I don't believe that's successful. And then you can have it sometimes, and this some, often does happen the other way, where everything's so sort of conceptual and beautiful, um, and you're actually not selling enough of the, yeah. enough of the yeah. product. So it has to, yeah, that's, that's the skill, I think, that balance between commercial. Yeah, and like, like finding decision. the just middle between the conceptual part and the design part. And of course, it has to relate, as we said, with the brand's uh, commercial objectives. And here, just to uh, for those who are listening, we need to um, make sure to point uh, that visual merchandising that we're talking about is uh, retail related, and we're not talking about any other art, purely artistic forms uh, that we're trying to uh, develop in store. Uh, so there is this um, relationship between brand strategy, brand marketing, commercial objectives that we're translating in store through beautiful visuals, yet uh, aesthetics that do not scare customers away and give the like look but don't touch feeling, right? Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so uh, when working with brands, now, uh, more and more, these types of brands, whether established or establishing brands, they are looking at developing pop-up pop stores. So when you work with these types of brands, what do you need to start planning for a pop-up project? Yes, I mean, um, I mean, a big part of my role right at the beginning is to um, fully understand um, the brand and understand holistically how everything um everything sort of works together 
um, and also to gain an understanding of what the brand wants to achieve from the um, the pop up environment because um, because I, I mean I believe that if you're going to do a pop up store it has to be like very different than your um, you know your main retail um, experience so that it so that it really um, attracts new customers or engages existing customers in a in a new in a new way. So um, I, I spend quite a lot of time to understand what the aim of that is um, and also to understand yeah, what the product story is and, and is the pop-up shop there to sell lots of product or is it about engaging, um, engaging customers and um, like exciting them about the brand. Um, and, and I think actually this, this is something that um, is becoming more and more important across all channels of distribution whether it's um yeah own retail pop-up or wholesale or online um that it's not always necessarily about someone making a purchase there and then at that moment um because they may well come and have a lovely time in your pop-up shop and then go home and buy the product um online and that mm -hmm. is that's just as that's just as important so it's not about sales through the till um, and that's that's sort of a little bit of a newer mindset, I think, for um, for retailers to um, to really embrace that, and all of those sales um, add up. So it's about understanding that and understanding the um, the space and the experience um, um, around around that, and how we want to showcase the the product. So often um, with pop up stores, um, it could be it could be about making people understand the story behind. Um, something um and so um it, it won't be necessarily about having lots of product in in volume but it it might just be a bit more lifestyle or information um driven um and to get people to touch things and interact interact with them um and also engage with the store teams which i think is like one of the most important things now that they're that they're um employed with the same brand values as the brand so that they, yeah, they yeah. just sort of soak it all up they naturally are good at explaining it because they believe in the in the product so i think all of those things um sort of need to come together um and then once i can understand that i can i can help define things like fixtures and how much space um, product will need what the customer journey will be through the through the space um what it looks like from the outside or or further back before you enter the area um, so I often just go through those stages step by step um, and then we can get down to the real sort of nitty-gritty about what sits on what shelf the, or table the detail or of the detail the yes. detail of it you need that big you know that big planning picture first as well right right so uh we're, we're looking at uh like a funnel um yes a way of thinking of the pop-up starting from the general uh, and going later on uh, into details however all the times you should be having a clear objective of what our pop-up store should be serving and as you pointed out whether selling uh whether presenting information and leading to sales and so on um however most of the times uh, when you're explaining about the process, um, you're taking lots of key concepts that uh, were maybe used in a physical retail design uh, of the atmosphere. So is there, uh, are there like similarities in planning uh, a pop-up store's atmosphere that are um, maybe taken from or adopted from traditional retail stores? Yes, yeah, well, definitely. I mean, there's some very um, sort of basic VM um, principles and, and store planning principles that um, apply um, to sort of any retail space about it feeling um, the right atmosphere. There's enough room to move around within the space. Um, you need to consider um, the shopping style of the um, your sort of target consumer that's coming in, whether, I mean, with a pop-up shop, they're probably coming in to experience and learn and understand and be intrigued by it. Whereas in a in a, a in a tradi more traditional sort of retail space, they might be on a mission. They sort of know what they want. To, they know what they roughly want to buy, and they just want to see the whole, um, you know, the whole selection. 
and and I think that you need a little bit of balance of both of those visual merchandising styles so um you no know, by block merchandising products like and that can be having all the t-shirts of one style in every different color you know yeah like Primark are brilliant at you know just have that all there and then you buy six six of them um, or if you're looking for cushions, you might want to see all the cushions together so you can make an informed decision. But but lots of people um, might need a bit of inspiration. So they I can have... related. Exactly. So yeah. they have more a life, lifestyle way of merchandising, whether that's a room set um, or a table setting or, I mean, you know, a mannequin dressed in, in all the products that you, that you sell. And then they might buy they might buy the whole outfit or the whole table setting. Um, but it's just two sort of different um, mindsets. And, and I think it's quite useful to be really clear um, mm -hmm. of those when you're planning a space. Um, and also sort of to alternate those as well around the space so that you, um, your eye um, is drawn through Flaws. the whole, the whole space because really the more products, the more you see and the more you go into a store, the more likely you are to buy and the more your, the more products you're likely to buy. So I always encourage people to yeah, alternate these two styles because if it was all blocked merchandising, it would be just like a lot. I always think of it a bit like um, a newspaper, you know, if you just had all the text on the front page of it or a website, just all text, it'd be a bit like, whoa, I don't know what we're talking about here. But if you've got a picture or, um, you know, a pattern or something different to break it up, you, you understand those different areas and, and you understand the, the product and you can see it. I right. think that's what it is. Because we actually only, actually visually only, are able to sort of look in I think it's about two meter blocks it's very difficult for us to take in um, a whole space and understand it in one go so it needs to be sort of broken down um, and that's the interesting thing about like smaller formats and and temporary pop-up formats is that is that you can um, you can think you know you can think about that because it has to have like an overall feel but within that you do need these little pockets of different things to um encourage people to stay in the space yeah yeah so you're alternating uh visually the store uh, to keep the customer's eye motivated uh, and uh, into moving and not having like a monotony all around and you're encouraging also uh, him to discover universes still see the product uh, in, in uh, all its available uh, forms if this applies uh, in the store. Yeah, exactly. And you're talking, you're talking about the customer journey, which is, which is an important term. And you seem to focus a lot on that through your design. Uh, so how, how do you conceive this, uh, Kat? How do you balance between uh, the customer side and the brand side when you're designing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a it's a interesting um, sort of science, uh, really, to um, to consider because there's some things that us as humans we sort of naturally naturally do, um, and um, so if you're coming into a space from the high from a high street, when you're walking along a pavement, you're actually walking quite quickly, um, and when you walk into um, an interior, you you naturally slow down but it but it takes you i think um i think it's they say it takes you three or four steps to you're sort of going you fast you go in and then you go oh well, i'm in somewhere and and yeah. then and then you can set off so sometimes a mistake that a lot of retailers make is by putting things really close to the um to the front front door because mm -hmm. they think that is important selling space and it is really important selling space but if it's too close people will just march straight past it because they haven't taken it properly where they are. Taken, you know? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so that's, that's always something that I think about from a fixture um, fixture planning um, perspective. Right. And then within the customer journey, you need to think about what all those other touch points are that you want them to interact um, with. So whether that's like key, key stories or, or important products to try, test and, and look at. The cash desk is another um, part of it. Fitting rooms, if you if you have, you know, if they're part of the customer journey, um, any displays, um, including your windows as well. That's all part of that 
that sort of planning what happens um, to the consumer when they interact with your brand and what you want them to what you want them to achieve um, from mm. that so where, where they have um, contact with the store team as well um, and and really on a very basic level it's to make sure that people um, go round the whole the whole space, space. and see everything um, yeah and and I think also what's what's really useful and what I tend to do is look at other like look at other um, sort of other sectors and how they do it. So art exhibitions um, are really good at getting you to go around the whole space and see it. And how how do they how do they manage that? You know what are they doing to make sure that you see you see everything and what happens at all those points and that, those things that you can pick up and translate into the retail environment really interesting and, and food for thought we're going to be talking about this in more details in a few <laughs> however <laughs> <laughs> however sometimes you are confronted with a difficult case I mean, conceptually, uh, we always uh, could think of the best solutions uh, to meet a brand. And uh, on the other hand, sometimes a retail project uh, that you are working with could be confronted with like many breaks, such as budget, time, people, or um, maybe you cannot have access to the right uh, fixtures or products that you want to. So all of these beautiful things that you are thought of are now put to test so how do you do that <laughs> well yes oh there always is and that's the other thing you know that's what I do love about retail is you know at the beginning I said you know you can be really instant but you also have to be quite reactive and be able to problem solve um, things you're right you can come up with the ideal beautiful scenario and it's quite important to do that so you know what what that what that is but then there's always um, compromises and um, yeah challenges along along the way. Um, I actually think from a budget perspective, that's sometimes um, that's sometimes almost is like the the least problem really because I actually think you can do quite a lot with not much money and um, and I always um, when I'm working with brands that have existing spaces. Um, we always talk about what what could we do right now to change it without buying the temptation is to like buy loads of new fixtures or completely refresh everything but um, I think that that you can do things quite cheaply or for no money and make things yeah. look different quite easily so um, so I think budget is like the bottom of the list of sort of challenges um, I think it can be around um, having yeah the right product in the right place at the right time is a is a is a big one because if you haven't got enough of the the product or not all of the items to make the collection that that is a bit of a that is a bit of a problem um, mm. and then also space the space can sometimes be um, a bit of an issue if you've got like funny corners or lots of pillars and but then that's a chance to be um, creative around mm. that um, and think of different ways to get people into the into the space and I think if you apply all of those basic principles that we talked about even if it is a challenging space it, it will you will do the best you can with that space if you still use those um, those same principles right Right. Okay. It's important, I mean, to highlight this because we could always have like stories of people having problems whenever it comes to budget and whenever they're creating their pop-up store. And on the other hand, a rising trend in developing pop-up store interiors is using like um, recycled material, right? Sometimes you get creative with what you have and you retransform uh, material. Have you done uh, oh, yes, this? Yes. Practice. I love doing that. I, I've, been doing, I've been doing quite a lot of work with um, with charity charity retailers, and they mm -hmm. are expert at that because they, you know, they obviously don't want to spend very much money because the the money is for their charity, isn't it? But they also get so many donations of whether it's pieces of furniture or. Um, you know they're so skilled at like asking for help or collaborating with other people um so yeah and it's um and it's become more and more important and it will continue to 
um, you know, continue to grow this, um, you know, sustainability within within every industry is obviously quite critical now. Um, but you can be so creative with within it, and um, and I think if you have a basic um, basic kit of parts, and I always talk about this to do with window displays. Actually, um, people say, how can you create? like really on a budget, amazing window displays. And I say, if you've got the basic kit of parts that you can do things, you can customize those however you however you want. And it, it does take a bit more effort, you know, whether someone's gonna paint something or you vinyl things or graphic things or, you know, repurpose um, older fixtures and furniture. But if you've got that basic structure in place, um, it's easier to reuse and recycle, repurpose, um, and all, yeah. all of those all of those things. And I think we're moving away from um, everything being very um, sort of um, I don't know corporate's the word, but I mean like in every format change, very formatted. Yeah, that they're all the same because I think they need to reflect their um, community and and the the local environment that they're they're in even if you are um you know a global brand i mean they're doing lots of work big mm -hmm. global brands about making their stores feel um linked to the community and local yeah more, more localized and personalized if you can absolutely. use the term right yeah yeah absolutely. yeah 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 right um and uh, talking about these uh, charity retail uh, pop-ups or activities and as you said your experience with them um uh, are there other objectives that the visual merchandising uh, wishes to put forward i mean is it only uh, like trying to sell the products um that the charity has or is it also um like a meeting point uh, during a, a specific period of time that the space also has to uh, think of or reflect through design? Yes, I mean, it's something I'm really in, encouraging. I think traditionally charity retail, um, you know, they've always tried to get as much product as they possibly can um, out on the shop floor. And there is an element um, because, you know, we talked about the different styles of shopping. If someone's going into um, a charity shop, they actually really love to have a rummage, you know, to feel like you've discovered, you know, a bit like, yes. <laughs> I mean, I really don't like shopping um, sale, you know, sale rails, but I'm very happy to go into a charity shop and go through, because you just don't know the excitement of um, knowing what you might find on the next little hanger or, you know, treasure, little, treasure hunt. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing about them. So, so we don't want to change that. But I think that um, they just um, they're working hard to be more focused on their categories so that they again, that they're clearer for the customer to mm. see um, what mm. category they're in. Um, and then I think there's a massive opportunity for them to use the space for different things. I mean, yeah. like, you know, for workshops um, to customize or um you know, change clothes so that they fit you or merge two things together or mending and 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 all of those things, um, there's a big opportunity for them, but they need to have the space. But, that, but then what they can do is, yeah, take on other little, air, maybe it's the next door shop that's empty. So it's a, a pop-up workshop room um, <laughs> where people can bring things in to be mended or learn how to knit or, I don't know, mend electrical goods. And, and I think it's really exciting, all of those, all of those things that could happen. Um, and and then that trickles down into you know um, regular retail um, does quite a lot of that now as well um, and I mm, think it's mm. it's something again about this localization and building a community of like-minded um, people so you know to communicate that to the customer um, and if you have the luxury of space I I went into um, so Italy had just opened in um, in London. Um, and um, and I went I went there and obviously it's a huge space and I mean it's amazing the amount of product and food and everything they've got there but they they're going to do um, you know pasta making workshops um, and so they've already given over the space and even though it's not being used at the moment it's still set up you know with the pasta makers and the chair and in a sort of classroom workshop um, and and even though they're not selling product from there it it means that I understand that that's what they're going to do and it looks really inviting. So I might go and book to do it. 
Um, so it's not to be afraid of having a bit of empty space that's not always yeah. being used. Yes, yeah. Yes. Different, yeah. Yeah, actually, I wanted to really like ask about this balance between aesthetics and like the sales place and the, the, the social place, as we're seeing more and more retailers, even with restricted uh, locations, trying to blend a little bit of both uh, to, to just animate and inject some, some life into their retail spaces, right? Yeah. It's just, um, yeah, it's about being flexible, isn't it? And so um, I've worked with a few people that we've made sure that fixtures um, are movable, especially mm. floor fixtures. So I've done things that, you know, we've always said, well, they, need, they do need to have wheels on because at some point we, we'll just reconfigure the, the space. The it's space. not as static as it, as yeah. it is. Yeah. You can move things to the side and... You know, if you're a fitness brand, you might do a yoga class in the middle of, of the shop floor because you can move move everything. Um, so I think it's, yeah, that's really important thing for um, brands to think about is the flexibility of their mm -hmm. space. There's some parts that are going to be fixed, um, you know, and if you plan those in as the fixed spaces and then understand what, what is flexible, um, and what can be used for two, three different types of, um, I don't know, activity, whether it's shopping, um, find, learn, shopping, learning, or experiencing. Sort of, that's three quite nice things, isn't it, to think about within one space. Yes, yes, yes. It's really important to, to put it like this, because at the end of the day, uh, if we're looking at maybe a longer term pop up, going maybe uh, around a week or 10 days, it means that we can reinvent even the space of the pop-up every time yes. uh, by hosting these events or uh, workshops, as you said, and it would give a sense of novelty uh, all the time, which is really nice. Yes. Um, and we're talking about so selling merchandise uh, and presenting some kind of merchandise. I know that sometimes space restricts, uh, restricts the brand into just putting whatever it has. What about now the choices of uh, the collection or the product that you want to put in a pop-up store and how can you advise on that? Yes, yeah. I mean, the range planning part of it is, um, yeah, is, is really important because that's what the customer is going to see and you want really sort of cohesive stories um, and it's I mean it depends on your brand and what product you're actually selling but I think as long as you can um, create these these different um, these different stories whether it's um, a coordinated story or a, or a blocked presentation um, and within that coordinated story you have enough range of um, items that work together but not too many so it becomes over overwhelming again so um so to think of a style or or a, or a color there might be a color that becomes the color theme or a, a key pattern um and that happens with clothes doesn't it so it might be just one key pattern or color story that happens um, and then i always advise people if they haven't got lots of space is to still be really focused on those product stories. Don't be tempted to sort of um, blur them just so you can get more out. You need enough yeah. volume so that you feel, the customer feels that you are an authority in that and you've got enough stock to sell, you know, got a full size range or you've got enough of it. But what you need to do is rotate that product really frequently. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that there can be challenges with that from a stock room perspective and from a, you know, physically actually doing it but um i think that if you haven't got much space you should be changing what the shop floor looks like really frequently and if it's a mm. pop-up shop that that can be you know like every other day um, mm. or if it's regular sort of retail space that you own you might you might do that every week every two weeks by taking stuff off the shop floor and bring something else back in um you know to give it and the time to sell because you can always explain to customers that they can um you know buy it online or there'll be other ways of buying that other product as well but just yeah. to give everything the space and the um you know the, the front of stage thing that it, mm. that it sort of deserves 
Yeah, and it also uh, is important uh, as you as you explained it because this would mean that the pop up store is an integral part of the entire uh, brand distribution channels, uh, and it is there not to compete or to be like an event on its own, but uh, to to reinforce the brand and reinforce the customer's journey throughout all of the brand um, touch points, as yeah. you said. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. No, really, no, really important. And as as we said at the beginning, it's about like understanding that um, the customer. It doesn't matter if they don't buy from you there and then, because they may come back to the pop up shop. They may go online as soon as they get home and buy, it, or even even in the shop. You know, on their mm. everything so mobile, they may actually make a purchase online while they're there yeah. and get it delivered yeah. home um, yeah. or, or they might be, might be inspired to go oh, well I'm going to go to your big you know main store you know in whatever city that's that's in um, so mm -hmm. it's it's about brand awareness and I think pop-up pop shops that's their that's their big big job um, anyway and, so. and big advantage as well yes exactly and, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and most of the times we encounter like uh, multi-brand pop-up stores i mean it could be a concept putting together different brands uh, at the same time however these types of brands might be selling different products uh, from your experience how how could we also create like multi-brand pop-up stores that are coherent uh, and that make sense all together I think this is really an exciting um, thing because Project. we've seen um, we've seen like depart like traditional department stores. You know they're really struggling unless you're you know Selfridges um, that can that 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 do this so well. You know the Debenhams and House of Fraser's of this world. It's um, like it, they're they're really not going to be there or just really struggle. But there still is a place for this department shopping, but on a on a I don't know if it necessarily has to be on a smaller scale, but it can work on a smaller scale. But what it what it has to be is that all of those um, brands that come together, they can be very different, but I think they have to have um, a similar um, brand values. Probably is the mm. is the part so that it links links together. So you know if um, if you're a fitness a fitness brand, you might have. Um, you know a lovely organic coffee or you know vegan smoothie drink takeaway um partner that works with you um you might have um, people that come and do classes in the gym you sell all the clothes um but then someone that does massage or um pilates or something you know so it, it all work there's lots of different brands and different product opportunities but they sort of have to link have a link together somehow yeah Re um, relevant connection Absolutely, yeah, and it can be. It can be around. I'm just thinking as we're discussing. It can be completely around the um, the activity, but it can also be um, around. Um, yeah, like a, a mindset. So it might be like a um, designer cro like crafted, handcrafted goods. So you, but that could be that could be anything from homeware to jewelry to fashion. But the link between them is that they're all um, handmade. Handmade. Or, uh, yeah. All right. 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 And the designers there maybe once a week, and, and there's that whole story around that. Yeah. Um, there's just got to be a, um, a a linking thread or a connecting thread yeah. uh, in whatever way that makes sense. Whenever these items are together. Exactly. Right? Exactly, and, yeah. and for us to be to be able as well to to tell a story about uh, all of them coming together, relating yeah. back to the idea of why the pop up is here, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely, and I just I just think that is going to be sort of the fu the future of um, yeah of selling, and I mean I'm sure you know um, the loan loan design club because I think they do this re really yeah really well. So Re independent. Um, fashion designers together in uh, you know temporary environments um and then they connect back to all their social media and they each do you know um a tour of their space and talk about their product um but yeah. what i also love about them and it takes um and i think other brands have done this but i think it's like it's just so interesting is in their shop windows so their displays 
um, they'll have outfits on the mannequins, but they'll have a QR code for every item on the window. So even when they're closed, you can shop, you can shop it. I mean, that's proper window shopping, isn't it? Really? I stood out really? there and just, you know, click the QR code and it just takes you directly to that item and you could just buy it there, there yeah. and then without yeah. going to the shop. So I think it's, um, yeah, like linking those people together, but then also linking all the channels of distribution together as well and um, making it as easy as possible for customers to buy stuff. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And, and uh, again, to, to preserve the integrity of yes. each brand uh, by like taking it to its website or social site, etc., which is really important. Um, and I believe that we've talked about like the developed brands developing charity and uh, multi-brand pop-up stores. So we're looking at uh, today uh, an activation of these types of stores for different types of brands in different circumstances. And all of the time we're looking at the creation or the reflection of these brand identities uh, through the interior and visual merchandising. Uh, what are the other things that brands should be thinking of other than aesthetics and merchandise to make their uh, pop-up stores a success, in your opinion? Um, I think they should be looking at how they, um, how they talk to the customers through their social media channels um, to sort of build excitement about the, the pop-up store especially if it's a temporary site that might only be selling stuff that um is specific to the you know to that store for a short period of time you've got to build that build that excitement so there needs to be a red thread through all of all of all of that um um yeah so social media um and also your store the people that are going to be in there representing um, the brand that's selling the product or explaining the product um, and I think that's I think that's really like really important to mm -hmm. um, to think about and to make sure they're fully trained and, and they're the right they're the right people um, in there um, and then also to think about um, how um, how you collect any sort of data like your customer data that you learn learn or collect from um, the pop-up um, experience so whether that means they sign up to your newsletter um, or um, or you just um, make a connection with them especially the store team because I think there's a real opportunity to build a relationship there um, as well and so they might go back and work in the main store so whether they have their own sort of like list of clients that they contact when something lovely comes in um, yeah. I think it's all that sort of customer interaction um, that's really important to think about on top of what it looks like and what the product um, is in there that it's yeah. equally important to um, make sure that yeah people love like fall in love with the brand really and want to come back again um, yeah 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 what you want them to do because if the pop-up shop sort of goes or moves or changes you still want them to remember you and and interact in another another way so it's collecting right. that data yeah yeah and and i really see um uh how much uh, importance you you place on that human factor uh in the pop-up um to 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 give more value to the brand and to keep the brand connected with the customers and it's something that we really need to focus on uh to keep that uh momentum i think moving from the store itself uh towards the the, the person's uh day-to-day -day life maybe to to let him share about the pop-up or talk to other people about yeah. us and etc yeah that's it's a, that's important a really, that's a really good point so like um yeah. you know like I, I mean i don't i don't love it that you have to sometimes you have to rate everything you know like in an uber you have to rate and they rate you and, uh, and then everyone like ask you to do a review or whatever but i think if um if there can be some in authentic um, ways that your customer becomes your influencer um, yeah, through social exactly. media or however, but but not in a not in a forced way at all, just a very mm. genuine a genuine way. Um, mm. That's what you need to sort of encourage. So there's a big you know reason to make sure that the store looks great, so that people you know take want to take photos or um you know share the experience with other with other people you know right. I, I've, I've 
I have been like many years ago, you know, asked to leave shots for taking photographs of things. Yes, but, exactly. But now it should and be. And now we're asking people. <laughs> exactly. I've had a sales assistant come up to me and say, Do you want me to take a picture of you? And I was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. when I've been escorted out <laughs> You're <of shots>. right. <laughs> You're right. It's funny because uh, when I used to work in retail and I was really young, I mean, I used to love taking pictures and I was kicked off. <laughs> I'm really like ma'am, you cannot. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, Kat, we have a little question. Um, how can on an online brand uh, that sells only a few products on it, website develop a pop-up store and make its interior like beautiful thank good. you for that question a really good question a really good question and i was um yeah i was talking about this with someone um someone the other day like um, individual designers and 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 how they could um you know they make beautiful things but i weren't sure how it would look like in a in a store um and i think that um i think the important thing there is um you know how we we spoke about finding um a other brands and or products that work with yours so that it's got yeah. the same brand values and um and but they work they work well together um and then i think it's um, about understanding when you're when you're sell if you're selling into um a retailer your product that that you give them enough um range um and enough items so they can make a story again yeah. you don't want just single things dotted like around the store because you sort of get a bit lost you want to keep your things together so it's got to be a collection and even if that's small things whether it's china um, you know i don't know china or jewelry that work together that look lovely together um mm -hmm. and and then they will give you the space um for that to be displayed you can also right. control that by um asking um people or providing um any retailer that wants to stock your product with with um, the display tools for them to use um, because most of them would love would love that and that can be as simple as like a colored block or um or specific hangers or so i don't know something that you can use that they can use that will really mean that they pull it together and it stands out and and defines um, as your your product in in the space yeah yeah and um, we talked a little bit at the beginning about a uh, practice that charity retailers uh work with a lot which is like collaborating and putting together effort from other uh relevant uh people or parties and do you think when a brand is still at Uh, at its initial stage, it would be important to work on with these types of collabs. Um, yes. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a really, yes, it's good. Yeah. Good way of, um, you know, connecting with customers and also connecting with the, with the retailers, whether you can offer to go and give them people, people are really interested in understanding. Um, and this plays back to like the sustainability part of things, but understand where things come from and how they're made. Mm. So, To, to you, um, you know, as a, a, a designer or maker or manufacturer, it might feel quite sort of obvious and feel, you know, this is my day-to-day -day job, but people yeah. don't know how something's designed or made or where it's made or how it gets to the shop. And, and they, they love, that love that story. So any ways you can sort of communicate that, um, that journey and whether that's, right. through, you know, giving a talk or, yeah, um, making a little little promotional sort of film or doing something on Instagram and telling mm -hmm. telling that story and also the telling the challenges about it as well not to be afraid to say you know oh this little thing went a bit wrong but then we then we did this and it's like amazing now you know mm. to be really authentic in that story and genuine and, right we have to like keep that genuine aspect with our yeah, customers yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. really yeah, nice to, to put it forward and, uh, that's the, and that's the beauty of smaller um it, that's why i do love working with smaller independent brands as well because they can they've got the opportunity to be really authentic it's much harder yeah. for big brands to um, be or come across as completely authentic because they're yes. just so large, you know. Um, so, right. yeah. They have to keep a certain standard and image, which could like uh, block a little bit this yeah. natural side of saying things. <laughs> yes. 
Kat, another question. Um, someone's asking if there is a tight relationship between the visual merchandising and in-store visual displays and communications. I mean, it's related to everything uh, that we put forward in terms of information and design in the store. Yeah, I mean, um, yes, there definitely has to be a, um, a link between the, the visual merchandising and um, the marketing as well. You know, that's why we, when we talked about um, the, the VM being, um, you know, just such a big part of the journey that it pulls, pulls everything together. So, um, so that all does need to marry up. So whatever um, marketing activity, if it's around a specific product that there's enough of it in the shop in the store to start with that it's merchandised in a prominent way yeah. um, and then from a display um, display perspective then yeah I mean it might well be that that product is that needs to be in the window it just all needs to it does all need to um, match you know match up um, and to make sure that there's enough of it because mm -hmm. if you're going to promote it online and in the press or however you know it's, there's nothing more disappointing than coming into a store and it not, you can't buy it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I think things have to fall again, as we said, into the right perspective, whether uh, you're presenting it and it's not there, you have to provide the right information to move your customer yes. elsewhere to get yeah. access to that. Um, and and this, this is, I think, uh, an important hint of the relationship between uh, in-store visual merchandising uh, of today's uh, stores and retail development and the technology or everything that um, relates to uh, the digitalization of our stores. Even if it's done with the minimum, which is our mobile phone, it yeah. still has to be considered, right? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's like a whole new um, job role out there to be an online visual merchandiser um, mm. now. Um, yeah. And so that, I mean, that just shows how important it is, um, you know, from the technology needs to be there to fulfill um, the selling and the delivery, but visually the, the website and how um, the customer journey again through the website, you know, that all, that all is um, very visual and comes under the same umbrella. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just um, everything links together, doesn't it? Yes, it, it's true. I think we have a last comment here. Um, it's very important from day one to work on collaboration as it improves uh, return on investment, right? And the impact will be different on people. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it relates back to, to what we, we were saying earlier that it's always important if it relates to the brand identity and the entire ethos. To, to find in the right collaboration at a certain point to uh, put like the brand out there. Uh, Kat, did we talk about everything that we wanted to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I think we might have done. <laughs> There's always more. I just, I just love, I just love, I do love my job and I just think it's everyone well not everybody but there's like a sense that oh a bit like oh god what's happening to retail now and like it's a bit little bit doom and gloom but I am so excited because I think it's really you know this last year has just shaken up everything and yeah. there's so much opportunity out there and people are always going to want to go into physical spaces, but, but they are going to change. And anyone that is flexible and forward thinking enough to, to move really quickly with the, with this time, um, are going to, are going to succeed massively. It's the people that don't change that are going to lose out. So I'm just so excited for um, the future of the high street and local shopping and retail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Me too. Believe it or not, this is a super exciting topic. And uh, I was keen on um, sharing this with you and having your point of view because you have worked with big and smaller retailers. And yet we're saying that uh, visual merchandising is an important part. And it's always important. I had a struggle once, like, uh, as you said, 10 or 15 years back, even if retail, physical retail was a big thing, um, lots of managers would fail to understand that visual merchandising is 
key uh, in the success of a retail store. And I'm glad that you that you put uh, in front of us all of these important concepts related to the importance of the aesthetic and the science part of visual merchandising. So thank you for that. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Kat, for this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful chat. Oh, lovely thank uh, you so much I enjoyed it <laughs> thank you and uh, hope to to meet soon yeah, be <laughs> physically <lovely. laughs> nice. and this um, for all those who are uh, here with us this um, chat will be available on IGTV and later on on YouTube and I will be sharing the links uh, with everyone so that we can always get back to this beautiful chat Thank you so much, Kat. Thank you. Wish you a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye, Jenna. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. <laughs>